We are near or at the zenith of new car sales per year. For a number of reasons, they're going to start a downhill trend soon, and Tesla and other EV companies are going to take a bigger and bigger share of what's left. What are the consequences of this change for the legacy auto industry, the consumer, and the world at large? Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. If you enjoy the episode, definitely make sure you like it so other people can find it and also subscribe for more. So I've mentioned this in several previous episodes, but I think it deserves its own special episode. So I'm going to explain my rationale here behind saying that we are at the peak of auto sales globally and also consider what's going to happen in the world and especially to the legacy ICE auto manufacturers over the next decade or so. The short version is, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Globally, we're up to about 100 million cars sold each year. 2020 is a little bit of an odd year, of course, because of the viral outbreak, and so there's been a huge dip. But, you know, if you look at the general trend, it's been going up and up and up. But it's not going to keep going that way, and this is why. For one thing, for legacy automakers, the global push to go green is going to have a huge impact on internal combustion cars over the next decade. Right, This is going to drive ICE car sales down, but that's not to say that all car sales are going to go away. What's really going to drive all car sales down is sharing of the resources. If you think about a car, right, your own car, if you own a car, it probably sits in the garage or at your parking lot at work or, you know, if you go to work anymore <laughs> anyway, you know, whatever that is, it's sitting for most of its life. You may drive it 5 to 10% of its life and the rest of the time it's just sitting there. That is a really, really big expense for something that's a massive part of your budget. I just actually ran some numbers with our Mazda CX-5 versus the Tesla Model Y and it is shocking how much money we pay every year to own a car. So as ride hailing services have become bigger and bigger players in smaller and smaller markets, the trend has started to happen where people are like, wait, I don't need a, you know, maybe you have two cars or three cars in your family and you don't live in a large city. You're like, wait, I could get away without one of those cars, right? So that's a reduction in sales. Um, certainly people in larger cities don't have very many cars at all because they're very expensive to own. And if you've got public transportation, you don't need it so bad. The big tipping point moment is going to be if and when autonomous robo-taxis come out. Things are going to change rapidly after that. If you look up here, I did an episode on how the world is going to change after Tesla's full self-driving 2.0 comes out, assuming that it actually works as advertised. So that is going to start a massive downward spiral in terms of car sales. So if you consider that episode that I just did, you spend well over $10,000 a year on a car. If you buy it new and you're paying it off, yada, 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 right? So with both of our cars, one of them being a little bit older than the other one, so it doesn't cost as much to operate and everything, you know, we're close to $20,000 a year, which is of our take-home pay, way over 20% of our take-home pay. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on how much money I make, but it's, you know, it's it's a massive amount. It's way more than anything. Even the mortgage on our house is less money than what we spend on our cars. So consider a car costs more than your house. It costs more than your food. It costs more than your vacations. It costs more than any other single item in your budget. Again, unless you happen to have a great deal of money, in which case it's not going to matter to you, but also you have more expendable cash. So you're more likely to be an early adopter and to decide just for the green aspect of it, or just for the fun of it to buy something like an electric car. And of course, we live in the United States, so the cost is even more in countries like Europe, where there are many, many more fees and gas is more expensive, etc., etc. So it costs even more to own a car in a large city or in a, a European country or someplace where they charge more fees and there's more infrastructure cost. The consequence of this, obviously, is that in large cities with good transportation options and high car costs, car ownership is already pretty down. That's, you know, that's been true for a long time. However, we live in a smaller market and we drive around 30,000 miles a year. So if we consider, I've looked at the national average and like, you know, Uber or something like that, it comes out to about a dollar a mile for ride hailing right now. So it would cost us about $30,000 a year to drive the same number of miles. Plus it's more of a hassle to get the thing. So it's still too pricey, right? If we're paying $20,000 to own our cars and it costs $30,000 to do ride hailing for the same number of miles, doesn't make sense economically yet. 
However, Tesla is claiming, uh, via a Teslarati article, that their autonomous cars will cost 18 cents a mile. But let's be conservative and say like 25 cents a mile. This is going to assume high usage rates. So it's got, it might take a while to get there, especially in smaller markets. But anyway, so let's just go with that figure. It may take a while to get there. But if that figure can be done and cars are readily available, right? So that you can call it up and not have to wait 20 minutes for your car to arrive. The annual cost to drive 30,000 miles at 25 cents a mile would only be about $7,500 per year. And that's only about 38% of what we currently pay to own our cars. At that point, why in the hell would you own cars, right? Also, if they're robo-taxis, you don't have to even drive them, right? It's not a ride hailing where you have to like get in the car and drive it. So there's an additional advantage of, of being able to do other things while you're in the car. With economics like this, people are either going to get rid of their own cars entirely and turn their garages into like movie theaters or gyms or something cool or just storage space like we have our garages, or they're at least going to reduce the number of cars that they own. So if your family owns three cars, you might reduce it to two. If your family owns two cars, you might reduce it to one. Just one car for the big long road trips or something. In the United States, we own about 1.88 vehicles per household and 9% of us own no car at all. So these are normally large city residents, of course. But at that rate, the rest of the United States, not the 10%, 9% that don't own cars at all, but that probably means right around two cars per household. That's really, really expensive, right? Just taking us. And we own normal cars. We don't own expensive cars. So again, what happens when robo-taxis or when or if robo-taxis really come into their own in, say, five years, so 2025-ish, which again is about what I'm predicting, again, in that video that I suggested, and they're serving towns of 100,000 people or more in at least larger markets like the United States, like Europe, like China, etc. In fact, I think China is going to be way ahead of the curve on all of this. What's going to happen is that car ownership is going to plummet. Generously, I would say maybe it could go down to in the United States 1.3 cars per household by 2030 or about 65% of what it is now. I, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it went down to 50% of what it was and only one car per household by then. This is going to affect new car sales even more than car sales overall because older cars, of course, can be kept around for a much longer time and also much cheaper if you're not using it that much, right? So if it's just mostly sitting, it's going to last longer because you're not going to put so many miles on it. New cars are hugely expensive because you have to pay them off often over time as we don't have the amount of money to just pay it all in cash. Uh, used cars are cheaper if you can get rides all the time and you just need a used car like maybe a pickup truck to like put stuff in and you know <laughs> go to Lowe's or Home Depot or something or again if you need to go to grandma's house and you don't trust a robo taxi to drive you 600 miles across the country etc etc but anyway you know the daily commute to go to work and everything why would you really want a car especially if it's driving you so you can in the 20 minutes or whatever it takes to work you can actually be doing work or sleeping or watching YouTube videos or whatever. Watch my video in five years, right here. <laughs> so at that rate, global new car sales could drop by half by 2030. That's 10 years from now. So they could go from 100 million to 50 million cars sold in a year. Wow, that's a really frightening thought for anybody who's paying attention. In the meantime, EV sales are going to be going up because again, Governments like China are really pushing hard, but even in more laissez-faire uh, countries like the United States, people are going to find that EV cars are less expensive, right? We've got those cost curves where ICE cars are basically staying the same, and we've got um, EV cars coming down rapidly, and really, really soon, probably within the next two years to maybe three years, it's going to cost the sticker price of an electric car is going to be less than an ICE car. Um, so that means that Anyone, any car company that is banking on internal combustion engines for the long term is going to lose out. I mean, obviously, you've got Tesla, a massive disruptor. You've got a bunch of other startups in China and the United States that are going to be disruptive. And then you've got companies like Volkswagen Group, which is clearly thinking about this and trying hard. They may have issues with batteries. They may have other issues. But they're probably going to be in the best shape because at least they're thinking about it. You've got other companies like Fiat Chrysler, uh, GM, Ford. I mean, Ford does have the electric 150, but good God, I think it's going to cost like $90,000 or something, right? It's crazy. Um, but, you know, they're not really taking this seriously right now. And they're going to lose big time when this switch happens. And it's going to happen really fast. It's not going to happen. We're going to hit a tipping point. 
once we hit the fact that the, the sticker prices of an electric and an ICE car are the same, it's going to go incredibly rapidly. Nobody's going to want an ICE car anymore. They're all going to want electric, and it's going to just the, the, it's going to plummet. There's not going to be any reason for that. And at the same time, compounded upon this, you've got the fact that car sales overall are going to potentially contract by 50% in 10 years. Additionally, something else that's going to be affecting this is, again, assuming robo-taxis are a thing, many, many of the cars that are going to be sold new are going to be sold as robo-taxi fleets, not to individuals, which means anybody without the autonomous driving software is just flat out going to lose out because they can't sell these cars, right? So again, if Tesla gets there first and they have a big lead, they're going to take all of that or they're going to license their software and hardware and other companies are not really going to be able to make money because they're going to be stuck paying Tesla massive royalties on their technology in order to also have robo taxis. So big problems on that also. So ICE car sales are likely to drop off of a cliff in the mid 2020s. Honestly, this pandemic may be accelerating that, right? It may be happening even sooner because of that, but let's just hold off on the FSD 2.0. I'm gonna do another video on that, so definitely make sure you <laughs> subscribe to this channel because I'll be doing that very shortly, uh, talking about what FSD 2.0 is and why it can be so disruptive. So let's think about like larger cities, right? Already car ownership is low there. It's going to get even lower at that point. More progressive countries like European countries and China are going to very rapidly go that direction. I could even see India doing that if they can get cheaper, cheap enough cars, right? Places where pollution is a big deal right now are going to be really, really driving for that green energy thing. And of course, rapidly growing countries like again, China and India and uh, the Far East, uh, the island nations, um, all of those countries are going to be pressing for this because they don't really have a massive or as massive an ICE car infrastructure and they don't have as much devoted to that as other countries do so they don't have as much of a block to just making the transition i think the united states actually might be a laggard in all of this because our government is so laissez-faire about all of this right now at least that they're not really pressing for this when they should be but it's going to happen anyway just because economically uh, ev cars are going to be cheaper than ice cars and that's just going to drive the consumer towards that after those larger cities and after those progressive countries will come mid-sized cities, right? They're going to start to convert as robo-taxis get spread out among all of those areas and it becomes very quick and easy to call a robo-taxi up. And then of course, nationally, as autos become available for long duration trips, I think that's gonna be a little bit of a sticking point, right? If it's Bob's robo-taxi fleet, he might not be super happy if you wanna drive your car a thousand kilometers or 600 miles to another town and drop it off. Um, but I also predict that what's gonna happen is these fleets are gonna start to consolidate. If you wanna make money, this is the thing to do, right? Buy a whole bunch of autonomous cars as soon as they're available. I wish I had the kind of money to be able to do this because I see it happening. This is going to be super disruptive. So what you do is you buy these cars and then you hold them and you drive them at a very high percentage of their, um, their life cycles are being used to make you money. And then, of course, what is either going to happen is you're going to become the big player and eat the smaller players or the uh, bigger players are going to eat you. And so they're going to pay you some money for what you've got. So either way, you're going to win out. But the consumer overall is going to get lower and lower prices because of the competition and the fact of like economies of scale. But eventually, the real final straw of all of this is going to be when there are these national fleets and they don't care if you want to drive from our house in Athens to my parents' house in Springfield, Virginia, which is like 550 miles or so. They, they won't care if you do that and drop off the car because it's national. And so at some point the car is going to come back and it's okay. So I, I very strongly predict that many, potentially most internal combustion legacy auto manufacturers are simply going to be unable to keep up with this rapid and massive change and the contraction of the market at the same time. This this is going to change by 2030. If you watch this video in 2030, it's gonna be like, well, duh, of course. But I think a lot of people are not paying attention to this right now and they are going to suffer the consequences. So again, many to most ICE car manufacturers are going to go bankrupt. Then there's a potential that they're going to get bailed out by the government. Ugh, because they're too big to fail, it'll be like the banks in 2008. I think that's a terrible idea. The government should just let them go. But they're going to bail them out, so us taxpayers are going to pay a ton of money to keep these things on life support. Then they're going to merge to make their cases stronger. And then they're either going to acquire the technology they need, which is potentially just putting a pretty 
body on top of somebody else's tech, like Tesla's, <clears throat> right? So they're going to license all the important stuff like the powertrain and the autonomous software and just put a different body on top of it and call it a Chevrolet. They're going to limp along due to brand recognition because people will be like, oh, I still want to buy a Chevy, even though it really isn't anymore. And, you know, maybe they'll find a way to work themselves back into the game or they're just going to disappear altogether. Either way, it's going to cost the taxpayer a ton of money. We're not going to see any of that out of it. And it's a damn shame that that's going to happen. But I do predict the government will step in because they've got very powerful lobbyists, at least in the United States. By 2030, Tesla is going to be the biggest auto manufacturer by far. Or potentially, you know, some Chinese startup, if they get to full self-driving first, if they have a super genius working for them and they figure this out first, yeah, they could do that. I doubt that's going to happen because Tesla has such a massive lead in data. But, you know, it could. But anyway, whoever gets there first is going to become the largest car manufacturer in the world. But remember, it's a shrinking pie at the same time. There will be massive fleets of robo-taxis even in smaller cities. Some people are going to get riach <laughs> off of owning and operating these fleets. Again, I, I don't know. Maybe I can find some people with money that I can talk to about this because, man, I see this as a massive opportunity coming up. So I'm telling you guys now, if you have money... I will, I will partner with you or whatever. Just give me a finder's fee for this or something. I don't know. But anyway, I wish I was rich enough to invest in this now because I can see it coming. Ride hailing is going to become extremely convenient and cost efficient. It already kind of is with human beings behind the wheel, but it's with more cars out there and very fast robo taxis, it's going to be great. We'll be able to do intercity drives with them, you know, so that's going to matter also. So it won't just be your daily commute, but it will be longer trips and things. So actually, you know, it could even affect short haul airplane travel to some extent. So that could be something. Think about it, right? If you don't have to drive the car, that hassle of going to the airport, waiting through security, waiting for the airplane, getting on the airplane, getting off the airplane, taking a taxi or wherever you're going, those steps add a lot for a five or 600 mile trip. It could be faster just to call up the robo taxi and then, you know, work while you're in the car, or do whatever the heck you want to do, right? So I could see this affecting short haul airline travel as well. So again, the pie is going to shrink. The economics are going to dictate that most people will see that it's way cheaper to rent a car by the mile rather than owning a car because it sits for so much of the time and is just not earning any money. Alternatively, people might purchase uh, robo taxi enabled cars so that they can make money as well. Uh, I think there's only a period of time where that's going to work before these robo taxi fleets are going to take over and make it difficult for individuals to earn money. But you never know. There might be conglomerates that could say, like, we'll allow you to become part of our network, a kind of like a virtual fleet, maybe. So ooh, that's even a better idea. Man, I don't know why I'm giving all these ideas away. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so, but anyway, you know, that, that could be a really, really effective way of doing it, right? So that you've got someone who's over the top of all this and manages all of it, like Tesla, and your, your car is just part of that when you're not using it. Autos are going to be utilized much, much more efficiently, right? They could be running something like 16 hours a day rather than the one hour a day that you're using them now. That's going to make them much greener and cheaper to run overall and much more efficient. Again, the more utilization you get out of a resource, the more efficient it is. And greener because you're not manufacturing as many cars. And also because they're not internal combustion cars, they're EV cars. People are going to think back to the old days and how they used to have to actually drive and they used to actually own cars and things like that, right? The old days is going to be 2020. We're not talking about that much time. But by 2030, people are going to look back on this and go like, wow, that was just a huge waste of money and time and energy, etc. People will also have more free cash, right? That will be nice because as car ownership diminishes, people will save money by not owning cars. The world is going to have much cleaner air because between having EVs and having fewer cars being built and fewer cars on the road, it's going to cause much, much less carbon emission than is currently going on. So that's a huge benefit. I, for one, can't wait to live in a more convenient world where I save money and save the planet. So let's get there soon. And if you want to help me to make it actually a reality, I'm happy to think about how to create a <laughs> robo taxi fleet with you. That would be super cool. So let me know in the comments. All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope it was thought provoking. If you did enjoy it, definitely make sure you like it so that other people can find it. And please do ask me questions or leave comments in the comments or ask me questions at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.